Hey, this is In the Moment with uh, Vinny Francois and Will Hines on the other end there. Hey, Will. Hello, Vinny. Uh, we are continuing our talks about the Herald, the improv form. Uh, this is episode number four. Um, if you've watched the other three, that means I guess you liked it enough to watch the fourth one. So great work. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, we're up to the point where we're talking about the third beat of a Herald. Um, so, Will, this is a good time for you to recap what we know. So the Herald is a structure, and the structure goes like this. You get a suggestion, you do an opening, and then you do three scenes, which are called first beats, and then a group scene, and you do three more scenes that are called second beats which are revisiting your first beats, and then you do another group scene, and then you do the third beats, which we're gonna talk about today. Right. Uh, how many times do you think you've given that description of a Herald in your life? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 75. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, that's so many times, I think. Yeah. Not, so if it, it, you see, like, you're so uh, well-versed in it, it feels like you're someone who probably had to give that, like, <laughs> Like daily for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've definitely had to talk a lot about it. That's for sure. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're at the third beat, which is the last section of the Herald. Okay. Um, and so what, what, what is the, what's the aim here? What's the game plan in the third beat? Connections. Connections and callbacks. Okay. Mostly, connect, connect, mostly connections, but also callbacks. Connections are where uh, you, you, you're doing a scene, and this scene is a third beat, which means it's the third time that we have been in this world. It's either we're, we're visiting certain characters for the third time, or we're demonstrating an idea for the third time, you know, um, in a way that the audience, it's very overtly clear. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's these guys again. Or it's, oh yeah, it's this scene again. This is the third time we're in that scene. But this time, as we're doing the scene, we want to run into characters from the other scenes uh, or ideas from the other scenes or phrases. We want to have a moment happen where it's very, over, where there's like an aha moment and the audience goes, oh wait, that's from the other scene. Oh wow, that fits in here. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that can be plot. Sometimes it can be like, the father of one, you know, we were, we're, we're in the, we're in the third beat of the first scene. And then we find out, you know, and it's like two cowboys talking with, they have daddy issues. Okay. And then we find out that a character from the second scene is actually one of their fathers. Okay. And he enters and it's like a big, and then when you think about it, it totally makes sense given what we know about the character from the second beat. Okay. And it's like, it makes sense, but it's surprising. That's a connection. So um, anything that makes that feeling happen counts. Okay. Um, you generally, though, want it to be like uh, a surprise. Like you shouldn't be trying to force it too much, although sometimes you do. Like if it's two cowboys, let's say the first scene is two cowboys talking about daddy issues. That's the first scene of the first beat. That's the first scene of the second beat. And now it's the first scene of the third beat also. Okay. Cowboys talking about daddy issues. And we explore that in various ways in each of the scenes. And then let's say the second scene is something that's like totally separate to that. It's like, it's like a McDonald's where they're, I don't know, a vegetarian McDonald's. Like they won't sell hamburgers. Right super healthy McDonald's. Like they only sell like the lettuce and the ice or something like that. Right. Some manager's taken over McDonald's and has gone, you know, vegan or something like that. Road. And, uh, and then the second scene is like, I don't know. I don't know. Let's just say it's a McDonald's every time. The sure. second scene of the first beat is the vegetarian McDonald's, and then the second scene of the second beat is the vegetarian McDonald's. So that we're in the first scene of the third beat. Cowboys with daddy issues. And they're like, just talking about how hurt they've been by their dads being absent and how it's 
hurt their idea of masculinity. And let's just assume that the scene is working, even though my description might not sound that funny. And then like the manager from the McDonald's walks in, just like walks up to these two cowboys and says, hey, I'm gonna buy all of your cattle and set them free because I don't think that cattle should be kept you know, murdered for meat. And the cowboys are like, well, that's another daddy who's just ready to abandon the flock or something like that. And maps daddy issues onto that manager. Okay. You know, and they get into like an argument about vegetarian versus abandoning, like murdering me, like letting the animals go is like being a bad father to these cowboys. Okay. And so the ideas are, are crossing over, the characters are crossing over. Yeah, so that's like, I mean, that's kind of a complicated one, but I was trying to think of two things that seem so separate, they would never come together, but then they do in the third beats. Right, and you're trying to fit it together, like you're looking for those connections. You're looking for it to happen. If you're doing this, Harold, you go into your third beats, you're like, what fits together? Right. You know? Uh, all right, meat from McDonald's is cattle. I got two cowboys. Maybe there's something I can... Maybe Something's I can put these guys together on that. Okay, and so you're not, and when if you're walking into that scene, um, from as like the person from the second scene into the first yeah. scene, like you're like trying to you know really bring back that character, so it's super clear what you're doing as that character, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you're walk, when you're walking in, you have to walk in and make clear what your plan is. You. You got to make clear that you're that manager from the McDonald's. You're not. You're not being another cowboy. You're not being like a farmer or something. So, like, if you're in your first scene, you're like you're you're the guy who puts his leg up on the chair. Then, like, you come in on that third beat. You like, oh, you put my leg up on the chair. It's like, okay, it's that guy. We recognize him. Absolutely, yeah. If you can do any kind of physical thing or a phrase or a voice, so that you, so that we immediately know who you are, that's really handy. Um, sometimes you just got to do like a little improv exposition. Hi, I'm the manager of the local McDonald's. Right. Sometimes you got to do that. Um, another, so common, okay, so people, there's lots of discussion over what makes a good connection, you know, like, and, and a lot of people, a lot of people, it's a matter of taste now, and I, I don't know of any way that it's totally taught. Well, one, one thing that's said is you want to avoid connection island, which is just like connection island is a phrase that I've heard in UCB, which is like just a place where all the characters coincidentally are hanging out okay. for no real good reason. You've just forced them all to show up. Right. They're just there. It's like pick the box and then jammed everyone in the one box. And like you're at the Starbucks too? That's weird. Like that's a bad connection. Right. And, and um, but it happens sometimes. You think it's going to be more meaty than that, and then there, when you think about it, no, there's no reason. And then your coach afterwards is like, "That was like Connection Island." <laughs> right. Uh, and when, once you've done your first scene, you have your second scene, and is that the same? Like, I, like earlier in the first, I think in the first episode, we talked about you end it where it feels like the most sad. I guess the most satisfying place to end it, where it's yeah. like, hey, that's it. Right. The, the third beats will go out of order more often. Like first and second beats always go in order. You do the first scene, the second scene, the third scene. You come to the second beat, you do them in order. First scene, second scene, third scene. We don't want them to overlap, so they don't. But now, in the third beats, things might go out of order. Like if We'll always generally start with the first scene. That's pretty regular. Um, but then if the second scene main character connects into this one, it would be weird to go do the second scene. We sort of have the second scene already, so you go to the third scene. Okay, I see. Uh, or you don't do that, and you go to like a surprise. You, you revisit one of the group games, maybe, which you don't have to do. Hmm. Maybe you'll do it. If one of the group games was like super fun, right? maybe, maybe we'll bring that back. <laughs> and then you'll start, so, and, you don't necessarily know how it's going to connect, but you'll just keep making choices and yes ending until the back line can see a way to connect this group game to something else. And so like basically the third B, like everything that's come before is fair game. So you can yes. use, you can use all the group games. I mean, yep. first and second beats obviously is going to be beating into it, but even, even the opening. Sure. If there was a big, big laugh in the opening, this is rare. 
But if there was a huge laugh in the opening and nobody ever used it, you could you do it in the third beat. Okay. Uh, I think that's unlikely. It's more likely to use group games. Or another common thing is, you know how you're doing an improv scene and there'll be some throwaway line that describes part of a character's life that sounds funny, but we don't explore it? Right. Where were you? I was at yoga class. But you don't look sweaty. Yeah, it's this weird yoga class where you just stand. Right. But then that's not what the scene's about. It was like this quick offhanded justification or something like that. Third beat, we might see that yoga class. Right. Somebody might be like, let's see that yoga class where everyone is just standing. Okay. So you... You're just pulling inspiration from like stuff that like maybe didn't get revisited or could like, yeah. oh, you know, I want to see that. Let's see that. Yeah. So it's really like... It's rare that you, you basically would never do anything new in a third beat. You're reusing everything that you, I mean, you would, you might further explore stuff, but like you bring stuff back and try to connect it to each other. So you're kind of like remixing your ideas, like, like almost like yeah. mashup kind of, to use a music kind of analogy. Yeah. So the first challenge when you're learning the Herald is just like remembering the show. Like it's sort of hard to remember everything very easily. But what, what happens as you do it more is like, Everything gets simpler. Um, like, you don't have to remember every single line that's said. Right. Uh, new improv students, they try to do that, or they, or they feel like they're being asked to remember, like, a transcript of the whole thing. It's not true. You just have to remember, like, there's daddy issue guy. There's vegetarian guy. Right. There's guy with feet up on his chair. Um, uh, my, my cat is wandering around. I hope that she comes on camera. <laughs> that's that's fair game. Yeah. Uh, the, if you're so you're kind of like when you're doing the Harold, you're like like by the end of the second beat and like during the group game, like like at the back of your head, you're like what what do I what do I remember from these first two beats? Like what stands out to me? And and those are the highlights. You're kind of like oh yeah, yeah this guy was really funny or this this um, this scene or situation was really great, and that's yeah. what highlighted to me. Um. You, you want to be able to be out of your head enough that you can, if for the scenes you're not in, you're just enjoying them, like you're genuinely enjoying it. And so, like, the stuff that's interesting is the stuff you remember. Okay. You know? You watch a movie that you like. <clears throat> you can't quote the whole movie after, but the, the big parts are the parts you remember, the, the emotionally crucial parts, the fun parts. Right. Those are the parts that you remember. The stuff that stays with you is the stuff you want to use. Yeah, so that's the, that's all you got to know. Right. I mean, yeah, it isn't going to remember the other stuff either. I mean, it's a similar thing in narrative improv where you're looking for your conclusion. You're like, well, what came before? What what? And what you remember is what the audience is going to remember. So it'll be vivid to them when they see it again. Yeah. I think a skill is like being able to cue the memory, like you were saying, like putting your leg up on a chair, using a phrase, a voice. Something that just like triggers the memory very easily, so that we know what you're pulling from. Mm -hmm. Like a little signature, a little little sign post to put up. Yeah, that's like that's like a skill. So being able to remember the stuff is a skill, and then having a sense over what the move is that'll remind people that's a skill. It's, um, it sounds like the Herald really places a premium on like efficiency, on like being really succinct. Yeah. And like getting to like the germ of an idea in a, like a very concise way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Being able to get at the heart of it is a main thing. Hmm. As you go, like you have to kind of. I the the first beat is like an oil painting, and the second beat is a cartoon, and the third beat is a stick figure. Like it's <laughs> it's getting more abstracted as you go. Okay, right. Um, and in the third beats, um. You're basically just kind of playing around with the ideas and looking for those connections out of the stuff that came before. Um, but are you, like are you are you trying to bring things to a head in a certain way? Like, is it like is are are you ramping up the show to hit this kind of like apex? Um, well, yeah, but only in terms of uh, absurdity and. Um, and surprise like we really avoid plot and story in Harold because like so we're not looking for a big climactic event so much Some, sometimes that'll happen but like 
you you don't tend to want the whole Herald to be everybody the whole Herald is talking about a birthday party they're going to or something or a bomb that's going to go off, like some kind of plot device, and then it happens at the end of the third beat. That doesn't tend to work usually. Stuff that you are saving for the future or planning for, I, I don't see it working a lot. The audience, the moment you say it, they're way ahead of you. There's no way to surprise anybody with it. Right. Um, I mean, but so sometimes it'll happen. Like sometimes you will do a Herald, the suggestion is birthday party, and the whole Herald is about everybody getting ready for a birthday party. The scenes are about something else. The characters have their own issues going on, and then it will end at the birthday party. But even that won't be like a big climax. It'll just, they'll, the climax, the apex comes from the, 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 how surprised we are about the connection, like how much of an aha moment it is, or how absurd things have gotten. You know? right. Yeah, it's not. It's not like the the just having everyone at the birthday party is going to be enough to satisfy people. Just like, yeah, we yeah. got the birthday party. We've seen that. Okay. I think I think it's a Keith. I've been told this quote. I've been told it's a Keith Johnstone quote, but I don't know. Maybe you know that like improv is like a car where the windshield's painted black and you can only see the rear view mirror. Right. That's you know I, I don't know someone more versed than John Stone than me might know that one but uh, I, 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 don't know who's, well, I don't know whose quote it is but it's a good one like a good one, trying, right? to, trying to plan for the future or say what's down the road isn't fruitful. It's always better just to think of the history of the character. That's always better. Right. Um. It, two two people for some reason two improv characters saying hey you remember yesterday when we did this thing. That that can work. That that has problems too if you're not in the present moment. But that can work if you're building a character. But it never works to be like you know what we should do tomorrow. We should do this somehow. I don't know why that that, that doesn't work. Right. Uh, I think I think it's I think this I think this might be where narrative improv differs certainly. Uh, in that the end of a narrative kind of usually comes out of your beginning, like the ends of things comes out of your beginning. And so there's like a neat little kind of circle effect that happens in narrative that can be satisfying. Uh, yeah. I think that, no, I think that applies. Um, the end is in the beginning is something I've heard. And I think about like, it's, if you call something back from the very beginning, the, the further away your callback is, the more satisfying it is. Right, so sure. at the yeah. end of the show, you can call something back from the very first scene the first line of the first scene that's very satisfying right i think i think and then you, you can you can disagree with me if you don't think i'm right on this i i do think like i mean improvisers are listening way more intently than the audience is but the audience like has that kind of like memory it's like in there lightly and so if you're intently listening and remembering things from all the way back and like like you say you don't have to remember the whole transcript but you do kind of have to remember the highlights or the things that have happened that kind of stuck out to you, and the further back you can reach, the audience will will recognize that 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 bringing that back, the further back you go, um, it's it's there. Like you you can reach it from the audience's mind and pull it out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you can remind them of it. Um, so g generally, third beats. You're looking for a connection. Once you get two or three of them, you'll black out the show. You'll rarely revisit all of the scenes. It'll just be like on the second or third connection, on a big laugh, basically, hmm. on a big like moment. But I've also seen Heralds where the third beat does something. This is rare, and if you try to force this, it's bad, but sometimes the third beat will be some weird, like some sort of, little structure all to itself. Um, like I saw a Herald a million years ago by this team called Optimus International that was like a super team at the UCB theater back in the day. Chris Gethard was on this team, Jack McBray was on this team, Shannon O'Neill, uh, Brian Husky, a lot of UCB stars. And they did a Herald that was like fine, that was like no big deal. Um, but the scenes were like um, a woman, a wife was being completely mean to her husband. Uh, a sister is being made fun of by her brother. 
it just sort of happened that the female characters were either like the bad guys or kind of getting shit on. Okay. You didn't notice that so much as it happened, but by the end of the second beat, by the end of the second group game, you kind of noticed it. It's like, man, every time Shannon played somebody or anytime anybody played a woman, they got kind of shit on. And so Jack McBrayer, after the second group game, stepped out and addressed the audience very presentationally, just as himself. I was like, you know, I feel like the women in this Herald really got, I forget how we put it, like really got the short end of the stick or something like that, or really got the short shrift. So what if, uh, what if the shoe was on the other foot? And then they revisited all of the scenes, but switched the gender and the specifics, like within like five minutes, they just did a super fast like montage of all the scenes, huh. the gender. So there was all these victories and comeuppets for all the people. And the audience like, exploded like with, it was a pretty virtu virtuoso, what? Virtuosic. Yeah display of virtuosity that they could just very easily remember all their scenes and super quickly do them all. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. That's rare. And that, that is kind of more of a plot thing, but like if you're a good team and it's available to you, I also saw one, another third beat thing. My brother was on this team, which was not a super team. It was actually regarded as one of the weaker teams of the theater at this time. My brother is like one of the best improvisers in New York and he's on a great team now, but at this time he was not. Would your brother agree with this assessment? He would agree with this assessment. They, they were okay, but they, they, they were not regarded as anything great. Right. Um, but they did, they did this great Herald where uh, they, I think either the group game or one of the scenes was they did a scene for a little while, and then a character enters and goes, this has been a test. I've been testing you. I set this all up to test you people. Um, you know, this isn't, a real, this isn't a real science class. I was testing you high school students just to see if you were being loyal to the ideas of religion or something like that. Uh, and I, that's actually kind of hacky. I see like a lot of comedy improv scenes where somebody walks in and goes, this has been fake. It was all a test. Right. Like it's kind of skirting the edge of being a denial sort of, it's kind of lame, mm -hmm. but it happens. And if everybody agrees to it, it can sort of work. And they had this character doing that. It was, it was pretty funny. The guy was really funny who, who did that, uh, but it was nothing special, right? That was just their beats. This guy comes in and says it's a test. And at the end of the second group game, or in the first scene on their third beat, he walked in and said, this, this is a test. And then, my, and then somebody said, somebody called them out. Like, they made a risky move. They're like, hey, man, you're, like, really screwing up this Herald by coming in and saying that these scenes don't exist. And then he goes, this whole Herald is a test. This whole Herald was not the real Herald. This was a fake Herald that I'd set up just to see if the audience is listening. And then my brother goes, so let's do our real Herald right now. And they did a brand new four minute long Herald where they got another suggestion and immediately just did like three line scenes of a whole new Herald. And when they got to the third beats of that Herald, they connected with scenes from the original outer Herald. Okay. And the audience loved it. Some meta Herald. -y. It was a meta herald. So that's like meta almost never works. <laughs> Calling step out doesn't work. But they like committed hard and again they could just remember everything and they ran through it. And I was like, damn, damn, they did it. <laughs> so so it sounds like the third beat, like your first beat, you're you're much more constrained on what you can and can't do. Like you're just you're there to, you know, grind, yeah. grind the meat for the sausage. And then the second beat, you're like, Okay, let's see what kind of sausage we have. And in your third beat, you're like, all right, let's play, let's play with these sausage. I don't know what my analogy got away from. Uh, that that's right, that's right. <laughs> you got to play with all you got to play with all the toys you built, sort yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I got another story for you. Yeah, hit me. So I saw this was one of my favorite ones. There was a team in New York called Fwand. They get talked about a lot, almost to maybe too much by old dogs, but nonetheless, they did a lot of good shows. And um, they did, they got the suggestion. So in 2008, there was a writer's strike in Hollywood where all the writers went on strike. So like TV shows stopped and uh, it was something that people talked about a lot. So they got the suggestion 
uh, scab. Okay. And, you know, scab is... Somebody because, calls him for a striking worker. Right, right. Yeah, scab can be a slang term for somebody who doesn't obey the strike and keeps working when all their peers are working. So they did, like, first beats that were, like, about breaking unions and about... I don't, I don't even remember what it was. There was nothing special. I, I, nothing memorable. I can't remember what the first beats were. They were good, but there was, like... They were doing pretty obvious inspirations on the word scab. Maybe they even did like wounds and stuff. But then, um, and then their second beats I remember were terrible. And then for the second group game, this guy, Sean Hart, who was on their team, said that the Herald was going, it's another meta one, I'm sorry. He said the Herald was going badly and that Fawn was going on strike. <laughs> and they all walked off stage. And then they all, this was a weird, possibly politically incorrect move, but they came back on as Mexican immigrants who were hired to finish the Herald. Wow. <laughs> well, a bold choice. It was risky. But there were these, in Spanish accents, trying to finish the Herald that Fuand had started. <laughs> and doing it like in these like Spanish accents, Mexican accents. And like... The, but these guys weren't fully informed. Like some of them remembered the scenes and some of them didn't. And they were like trying to tell each other, no, I say you need to be the whatever, so-and-so. I mean, it's, I don't know. It was a weird choice. <laughs> and then, and then Fuan came back on, like Fuan was doing these. Right. But then Fuan came back on stage and finished with the Mexican characters. So everybody was playing an English version of themselves and a, not everybody, but lots of the people were doing like the Mexican and the English version of themselves. And they all finished their own third beats together. And it was uh, super funny. It was like kind of crazy and weird, but I remember being like, that's fun. <laughs> so, so I guess what, what would you say? I mean, what would you say delights you in a third beat? Like what, what is satisfying to you? Will Hunt? Has to like, so, you know, Fulfill the pattern, but surprise me. Okay. It's got to fit what's come before, but in a way I didn't expect. Okay. I'd say surprise is the main goal. If you surprise me, but, it, you, and, but you invalidated stuff and you kind of broke stuff, that's okay. Right. It's not great. But the real goal is to surprise me and you, and you make it all true. Right. So like, like the surprise makes sense. Yeah. In some ironic way, the surprise makes sense. Right. You know, everybody fulfills their pattern in a way. Oh, I didn't. Ah, you're right. That does still fulfill the pattern, or something like that. Um, that's the goal. You know, and also a little feeling of danger, like, oh, you really, you, you really, you call the tough shot there in your third beat. Right. And then trying to nail the landing. Yeah. Those those big like thematic third beat things are rare. Like everything kind of has to line up, and sometimes improvisers will see a herald where there'll be like a cool third beat, and then they'll try to chase that and make that happen every time. Right. That's a disaster. Like part of being good at it is knowing like we're just gonna do our scenes. This herald is just we're just gonna do our scenes. Like there's nothing there's nothing meaty in this. Right. It's you have to just let it be what it is, and then use what you get. Yeah. And then sometimes special moments come up. Right. And that's, that's yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, and for the, and then like, I guess, is there anything after a third beat? Like what, just like you come out, you bow, you say goodnight? Like what? You blackout, lights up, music, take a bow, you're done. All right, great. Um, and so like for a Harold show at the UCB, how are they generally present? Are they presented two at a time or? What's the deal? Um, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I forget how they do it in New York right now. They might do three at a time in New York. Um, but I, I'll just say in L.A., they, a host comes out and welcomes the audience. Usually that host is from another show running at the theater, and they'll plug their show. Hi, I'm from a sketch show on Wednesday. Harold Night out here is Monday night, so somebody will come out and be like, Hi, I'm doing a show on Thursday night, this Thursday at 930 They'll do like a little thing, and then they'll be like, they'll, then they'll say, oh, this is Harold Night. Harold is a forum developed by Del Close in Chicago. 
We're proud to do it tonight. We got two great teams. Please welcome your first team, you know, whoever, you know. The 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 badges. And then they come out and um hi where the badges can we get a suggestion? They'll get a suggestion, they do a herald. Blackout, bow, host comes back out. Wasn't that great, folks? Wasn't that great? Something else. Um, all right, let's welcome our second team, and they just call them right out, no intermission. Okay. And then at and then at the end of that, that's the host will come up and be like, "That's our show, thanks." And then the whole thing takes an hour. The whole thing, and then like, is there is there another Harold show right after? Or? Yeah, they'll, there's Harold night is two Harolds at eight, and then two Harolds at nine thirty. And so, I think we switch the audience too. So the audience for the eight o'clock has to leave, and then we let in the nine thirty audience. I think we used to let them stay because there wasn't enough demand, but now we've got enough people waiting that we switch the audience. Uh, can can you watch two Harolds in a row, like two house shows in a row? Is that what do you mean? Like, I mean, for me, when I watch improv, like, like I, we put sometimes we'll put on like three, just any if any three improv shows, and if I yeah. watch like you know four. Oh, hours, can I can I do it? You like how many hours? Like, how long can you watch uh, improv for? Like. Especially, yeah, watching two is tough, man. I've seen so many; it's rough. I have trouble watching anymore. No, I understand that. I'll watch one pretty happily, but then the second one will start, and I'll be like, I don't know. I feel like doing something else. <laughs> right. If there's brand new teams and there's friends of mine who are super excited to be on Herald Night, I'll watch out of like support because I'm excited for them. Right. Um. Although you know, last year or two years ago. Uh, I was asked to watch the auditions for Herald Night, and there was 17 Heralds in a row we watched. Right. Uh, we watched, yeah, that's the most Heralds I've ever watched in a row. I remember marveling at it. I was like, I can't believe I'm going to watch 17 of these today. We watched starting at like 10 in the morning, and then until like 5 in the afternoon, we just watched Heralds. And it was uh, insane. Like, you go insane. <laughs> like, you, you, like I, I remember, like, Working one summer, like uh, I, one of my summer jobs was working at like at a carnival, like a, a roller coaster amusement park. That's the word I'm looking for. And I would just like work like sixty hours, just doing these like hawking these games. Like, hey, come on, play these games. <laughs> and I would work for like uh, like a like a twelve hour shift, and then I would come home and sleep, and then I would dream about my work, and then yeah. wake up, and then go do like another ten hour shift. So yeah. if I had worked like thirty hours in a row, like some. Like and then at the end of it, I was like, "What dream world do I exist in?" So like, I can only imagine what watching that many yeah. would be like. It was crazy, and you know, they're all trying to get on teams. They're really like motivated to do a good job, and like, they want to be considered fairly. You want to you want to like be invested so that you're so that you're really paying attention. But it was hard. I think I I didn't do it this last year, and I think they split it up over two days, maybe even three days. Uh, which I think is more fair for the people being watched. Yeah. Once you've seen 16 heralds, you you can barely even see the 17. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're definitely super impatient in a way that's not fair to the players. Right. Like you want them to get to it in a way that people can't get to it. Right. Because you uh, you your brain is kind of like snow blind at that point, just like uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense to split it up. Yeah, and uh, and do you do you still get like a thrill out of watching a Herald? Like, like oh, yeah. I yeah. get a. There's a team at UCB LA right now that I really love watching. There's a couple teams. There's one in particular that I really like, and um, you know I. And I, I'll be and I, um, I definitely love surprising third beat moves or something will heighten. Um in a way that I didn't expect and it would really delight me. Yeah, I love good improv, you know? Good improv is still blows my mind. Right. Um, I, really, I really am hungry for confidence and decisiveness. There's understandable tentativeness and hesitancy when people are starting out. I, I understand that, but it's, I can't watch that. Right. I need people to move boldly and live with the consequences of their move, good or bad. I can watch that pretty easily. Okay. You just own everything you do with no apology. It's very fun for me to watch. And I don't care if you screw up. But I do care if you're being so careful in particular, I can't watch it. 
Hmm. I'd rather have it be wrong but bold. I mean, I'd rather have it be right and bold, but like, obviously, I could watch confidence. Huh. That's that's what I look for. And sometimes there'll be teams that just have a lot of performance swagger. They're just comfortable on stage, and they I don't know. And they notice shit. They don't let stuff go. They maybe don't always heighten everything or reconcile everything, but like they, they notice what you notice and talk about it. That's like the most satisfying. Hmm. When they where they're really like hyper focused on each other and just like this. I just saw that. Yeah, like I saw a Herald Monday night, and somebody said like, "Hey man, look, my braces are gone. I ripped them off." And the other guy goes like, "How'd you do it?" And he goes, I took my mom's pliers and I ripped them off one by one. And the other guy goes, your mom's pliers? <laughs> and the guy goes, yeah, man, I was raised by a single parent. That's not weird. The guy's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute, you ripped them off one by one. Why didn't you do them all the time? He's like, because I'm supposed to wear them. I had to hide them from my mom. <laughs> He's like, well, how did you hide it? He's like, I just kept talking out of the side of my mouth where the braces still were. Like, so I liked, I mean, you could say like, oh, one dude was sort of, picking on the other guy and picking apart his logic. But I wouldn't say that. I'd be like, nah, man, he was noticing what I noticed. Right. He was forcing everybody to, to step up and explain the stuff that was noticeable. And it was really, and the dude wasn't tripped up. The dude had answers. They were, they were in it together. Yeah, they were, it was fun. I really, I loved it. I, I like, Here's something. How how long is a weird term, but how long does it take for like a Harold team to really gel? Like, do you think like what 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 is yeah. like, when they first form and then when they're like doing great shows? Like, what what what's in between? What's the magic you know voodoo that goes on in there? Um, I think it's more like players mature, like individuals. I I don't know what the number is, but. I mean, I think as an improviser, you need three years to cook, no matter what you're doing. Three years to like come to be have your persona available to you as you perform. That's three years. So like, you can't do a good Herald unless you're cooked, uh, you're ripened. And then be, being good at Heralds also takes like a year of doing a lot of Heralds. Mm -hmm. That that could be part of your three years, but like that has to happen. Um, I don't know what the number is, but if uh, let's say a hundred, you have to have done a hundred, so that it's just pretty com comfy in your brain. A right. hundred isn't that much. If you're practicing once a week, you'll do two heralds in practice, one or two heralds in practice, and then if you have a show every week or even every three weeks, you'll hit a hundred before a year is up. Right. Pretty pretty easily, so like that's that number might sound high. That's not that's not that high. It doesn't sound that high to me. Yeah, I mean, practicing yeah. improviser, but it's still a, you know you're doing a butt. So if you've done a hundred heralds, and you and you are and you've got three years of experience under your belt, you're ready to do a good herald. Um, and then it's a question of chemistry. I'd say a team needs six months to fully get comfy with each other. After six months, like they're they're not nervous anymore, and they're they're not being too polite with each other, and they they know what each other's got, sort of. But I will say that the best this is going to be demoralizing for some people, but the great teams, the great teams are great right away. Okay. You can tell in the first two shows, I'll say three, but usually the first one, they got something. They they have the right combination of aggressiveness and smartness. Okay. That they're just, they're playing harder with each other. They usually it's just that they're smart enough to fully hear, not smart like in terms of trivia knowledge, but like improv smart. Like they're they understand and can and, and can can address the problems that they create on their feet. They don't miss each other. They don't they don't misunderstand each other. It's there pretty early. I usually can see it in the first show if they're going to be a great team. Right. It doesn't mean they won't be a good team, though. If I don't see it in the first show and they're just okay, six months later they might be a really, really good team. Okay. 
but the but the great ones, the ones who are like, oh, this is something special. That's almost always you can see it. You, so, you see the pistons firing early. What what makes a good like what are the qualities of a good Harold player then? Like if you like you talk about good Harold players, what makes like he's smart, you know, improv smart. What else? Um, well, you need I'll say amongst the whole team, you need a big critical mass. The most important thing is they very reflexively say yes to the first offers and and make it true. No matter how crazy or bad the first line is, they say yes to it and 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 prop it up. Right. They make commit it. to it. Yeah. The first two lines get get agreed to. You got to have almost everybody on your team does that. You don't need everybody doing that, but I would, if you have eight people, you need six of them who are just like good at committing. Hmm. So you do something that's traditionally, let's say, a bad initiation. Let's say like you say like, "Hey, man, I don't know who you are, but play this board game with me." Like inactive stranger. That's a bad initiation. Um. But if this is a good team, I'm not going to be dismayed by that. I'm going to dive in like that's a good move. I'm going to enjoy the fun of being a stranger and the fun of playing a board game. I'm going to say yes and commit and make that fun, no matter what. So yeah, I got the chops to do that. I, I don't need it to be a perfect initiation, right, for me to say yes and have fun. So that's the first thing, saying yes and committing. But then the second thing is like, being funny enough to recognize what's dumb and silly about any moment and like hitting it, like exploiting it. Like without saying no, I'm going to enjoy what's weird about it. Like, hey, I don't know you. Play this board game with me. Yeah, man. I love playing board games with strangers. I'm sick of playing with friends, you know? Right. I'm a board you play with friends. So, you know, I'm going to take what is normally a problem and make it funny, you know? Right. I like playing with strangers because I can play hard. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, he wants to play a board game hard. That's funny. So, you know, you find funny stuff right away, funny people. And then, um, and then, uh, great memories. Like, they just, everybody can remember the whole show. They're not thrown by callbacks and connections. Right. I'd say that's not as important as the other two, but you need at least half your team good at that. You don't need everybody good at it, but you need half the team can recognize any callback that's happening. Hmm. Um, and great justifiers. They can, you, you, get call, you get asked to explain stuff. There are so many pieces being reconciled that all the time people are going to challenge you to explain yourself. And you got to be able to do it, no problem. Right. You can't be scared when someone goes, why are you doing that? Like, you need to have an answer. When it, somebody says, your mom's rent, your mom's pliers, you got to be like, I'm a single parent. Or like, moms can have tools. Don't be sexist. Right, right. Is, is, would you, would you describe the Harold, uh, a pitfall of the Harold as being too talky? Um, no, uh, a pitfall of, um, a pitfall of premise initiations can be that they're too talky. Okay. Like just, uh, people who are trying to put all the funny in the first line can sometimes be too talky and they need to challenge themselves to be more, um, try to do it with fewer words and more physicality, more character. But that's like an individual habit. And I hadn't thought of that. Maybe you're right. I mean, maybe you're right. But I think that's more like players, player skill than something that's a Harold problem. Right, yeah, sure. I mean, I've been for the Harold play. Like, is that a danger for the, the, the performers to just get kind of trapped just being like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. If you, if you do too much talking in your first speed initiations, it's usually too complicated. Right. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I, this, I don't know. I think, I guess I'm out of questions. I'm having a hard time just. Well, I'd say that like finding you, 
I mean, I think this is the challenge that all comedy creators find, but like you want ideas that are simple and fun right away. Mm -hmm. are like, and a lot of times it's a character or, I don't know, this is just, this is just the part where good comedians have a skill for like, and I certainly don't always have the skill, but like finding something that's funny and simple right away, just like, and usually it's your, your opening will have funny stuff in it. And then if you pick the right, the, the best stuff from the opening, the audience loves it right away. Um, like, I don't know, there'll be, like, the opening will describe a dad, something that the audience just delights at. Like, my, it's so hard to come up with examples, but, like, dad's ordering calamari for the table might get a laugh, because that's, like, a, I, I, just, I direct a sketch group, and a, 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 um, one of the writers wrote this really funny sketch about a dad who loves ordering calamari for the table, just like that's his thing. It was a really funny sketch. And I was like, oh yeah, that is kind of a dad thing. Hey, this is for the table, this calamari's for the table. <laughs> the specificity of it really made me laugh. So if there was a Herald where somebody did that, mentioned that in the opening, dads love to order calamari for the table and the audience laughed at it, you could start a scene just like as a dad, being like, hey, guess, hey, on my treat, this is on me, round of calamari. Like you could possibly like have the audience just with that. Right. We still got more work to do in terms of a premise and stuff, but simple and fun and relatable right away is pretty golden. Hmm. Well, do, do writers have an advantage over uh, like say actors? Like if you have one who's like a stronger, I mean, you need to do both, right? Like, but do you, do the I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. The Herald has so many ideas floating and it's and and the initiations are crafted from an opening that that you know writers are good at that like cerebral analytical people are good at that so i'd say that the writers they they are needed more than they're needed just in a two person scene off a suggestion hmm. you know people with writer brains can really come in handy in a herald in a way that we don't need them so much in other improv forms. I think that's true. But on the other hand, if, they're re if they can't act and they can't commit, the, the show will die. Right, right. I don't know what to say, like you gotta have both. I mean, I think that's why the Herald is so enticing. Like you can't, if you're, if you're an empty headed actor, full of charisma, but you can't remember anything and you can't keep patterns going and you cannot craft in a, a good start, you're dead in the Herald, you're dead. It'll be, it'll, it'll flame out. But if you're but if you're a robot who will not emotionally react and will not be affected by things, the audience is going to abandon you. So you got to you have to be both. You got to be a robot with a heart. Like there's just there's no you, it just doesn't work any other way. Okay. I'll say this: if 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 there is a great Herald team and I've seen them, I'll remember. I to me that's like the best comedy resume as an improviser. You know. I'll be like, what, you know, there's a famous team in Chicago called The Reckoning in the 90s. They were like a big uh, Herald team at I.O. I'd never seen The Reckoning, but I would just heard through reputation. Oh, The Reckoning is one of the great teams. Like it was said to me so definitely that whenever I meet somebody on The Reckoning, I give them props because to me, it's like, that's like they came from the Harvard Lampoon, you know, or like, or they wrote for The Simpsons. It's like, you, you got to, you can do The Herald a lot and you're great you're great you're you're a you're an unbeatable improviser right you won't be thrown by anything and yeah. i and i've done improv with two of the reckoning and it was like one of the best shows i did is like so much fun the the does it sometimes do you, does it sometimes feel like you come off a of herald and you're like what like where did that come from like it like almost like unconsciously works or you do feel like you're like oh we worked at that we earned it we nailed it uh you know all improv scenes have the potential to go to a place you never expected and you're like where did that come from you know uh heralds there's so many ideas in a short time that yeah group mind will do weird things sometimes 
two people will walk out with the very same specific in mind that you won't expect something totally weird. Hi, I'm a thermometer salesman. Hey, I'm a, I was going to say after the show, you'd be like, I was going to say thermometer salesman. Why would I say that? That's like, such a weird thing. Right. Um, I know this, that like how good or bad you feel before a Herald has no bearing on how the show will be. I have felt great and then gone out and stunk. And I have felt miserable, like I got nothing, and the show's amazing. There's no, there's no way to know until the show starts how good it's going to be. Hmm. And uh, I guess this one, this one kind of is uh, ancillary to the Herald. What makes the good Herald venue? What do you, what do you like when you're playing at a Herald, as as far as space goes? Venue? Yeah, sure. Like any improv thing, uh, improv isn't great for huge venues. You got to be able to like see every twitch on their face. I feel like once you get above a 250 seat theater, it gets hard to. Mm-hmm. Hard to do good improv. Um, I mean, it's best to me where you can, everybody in the room can hear the people pretty well unmiked. Right. Assuming that they're performers and they're projecting somewhat well, everyone in the room should be able to comfortably hear them. So we're talking 250 seats. And above that, I think it's hard. I mean, I've seen improv where people have like, you know, like face mics. But uh, you lose something. There's a wall between you and the performer and it starts to be not as good. Hmm. Um, very small venues where, where you're talking like 10 to 20 seats or something like that like little like really small places eight people is too many people on stage and it's weird All right. and you know you, it's better if it's a three or four person team um, you know and then every venue I've done has its own flavor regardless of size like Chelsea the UCB Chelsea theater is very big plush seats that absorbs the sound and it's like uh it's soft and dramatic and it it lends itself well to being committed scenes ucb franklin out here in la is like smaller and the audience is right on top of the stage and it's very present and it's more lively and high energy but it's harder to commit and to like sink into your scenes because the audience is like right on top of you um we have another UCB stage out here called UCB Sunset. That's more like Chelsea. It's more like dramatic plays feel like it's going on there. The audience is further away from the stage and it's darker. So it's kind of like more like serious, man. It's like more like intense. I'm sure. What's your, what's your theater like? Um, our theater, it's about 75 people, the Montreal Improv Theater. Uh, it's got like, you know, it's a stage up the front and then it's like a floor on the, for the first three or four rows, depending on the seating arrangement. And then some risers at the back for the last three rows. Um, it doesn't go, I, I think, I, I mean, we designed it for improv. Like we rented a space and got an architect in and we kind of really put the space for improv. And I think it works pretty well. Like nobody's too far. Nobody's like. We, you don't want anybody like you know, kind of, you know, feeling the sweat fly off your forehead either. Um, mm-hmm. But they're like right there, like they're all right on top of you too. So there's like a good mix of, of of like people feeling really easy to connect with the audience, and everyone has a great line of sight, and no one's really uncomfortable. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm pretty happy with it, and people. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Who visited have been pretty happy with it. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I agree. Like you need to be able to hear, be heard on mic. You need to be able to 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 c- just connect with that audience to f- have them because it's like that back and forth in improv. That's awesome, right? With the with the crowd yeah. feeding you that energy, and then you feed it back to them, and then there's that that fun game that that's the second show, which is the show between like the actors and then the, and the audience. That has right, to be- right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun, man. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I guess we can wrap this up here, yeah. uh, and we'll we'll do one more episode talking, just talking. I don't know overview. Yeah, we'll do a wrap. We'll do a wrap. We'll wrap up. Talk about the Herald. And we'll do a, a coda. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks right. a lot. Bro. Bye. Bye.